Okay, and we are live. So welcome back to, I guess the five, the the, the fun finale. This is the grand finale um, of how does racism impact black women in the workplace? And so tonight you will be hearing from not only myself, but three therapists that were contributing experts to the anthology, Shut Them Down. So, um, if you are kind of in the dark about what we've been talking about over the last four weeks, each each Thursday, I've been coming on LinkedIn and also Twitter and having a conversation with some of the co-authors from the upcoming anthology, Shut Them Down, Black Women, Racism in Corporate America. The link is down below if you would like more information about the anthology, if you missed some of the past um, lives that I've done, or if you want to see who the authors are. And basically, this is a project that we started working on back in July. Um, the book will be out on Amazon in the next two weeks, but you still can pre-order a copy. And it contains the stories of 20 Black women and um, the experiences that they felt um, when it comes to racism in the workplace. All of their stories are different. No two stories are alike. And it puts you on an emotional roller coaster as the reader. So as being the editor, I really, I could relate with a lot of the stories. And then some of them, it was just like, girl, like, really? What I, you know, you ready to put on your boxing gloves and go to their job and fight for them. Um, and so as I was going through the stories, I realized that I needed a balance in the anthology. And that is when I asked these three ladies. Um, who are on tonight, if they would contribute some advice from a therapeutic point of view. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about some of the things that we saw in the stories. And we're also going to just talk about, in general, you know, how some of the things that you experience in the workplace can impact you mentally. Because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, some of this stuff does have a lasting impact on your mental health. So what I'm going to do is go around the room and allow the virtual room and allow each of these therapists to introduce themselves. And then we're going to jump in. So we're going to get started. I'm going to start with Tiffany. So Tiffany, let everybody know who you are, where you are from and what it is that you do. So, um, Grateful to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Tiffany Jenkins. I am the founder of Awakening Change Counseling Services located in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I am a substance abuse and mental health therapist, um, workshop, workshop <laughs> facilitator, can't talk, um, and um, I think that's it. That's me. So next we have Dr. Dangerfield. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Lucretia Dangerfield. I, uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I have a private practice here called Reimprint Your Life, Coaching and Counseling. And really what I do is I work with other, other mental health professionals, helping them to be mentally well in the work that they do. All right, thank you, Dr. Dangerfield. And last but not least, we have Carol Sandy. Hello, I am a couple and family therapist. I work with individuals and I help many people just to get back on their feet as we all do and support them during difficult times in their lives. Love working with couples and understand the, the importance of having careers where we're happy and feel supported. All right, thank you, Carol. So, um, so we're gonna go ahead and start with our first question of the night. And the first question of the night is, can a work environment be traumatic? If so, what does it look like? Who would like to tackle this first? And all you have to do is just unmute yourself and jump right on in. I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I think work environments can absolutely be traumatic um, without a doubt. When we think of what trauma is, um, and how it impacts not only us mentally, but physically, it's very, if we look at the textbook, the, the textbook definition, or we'll, we'll just say like a general Webster's definition of 
anything that we call trauma is a, a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. That's it. It it doesn't mean anything more than that. I think that because we've heard that word associated so frequently with things like molestation, with child abuse, with um, intimate partner violence and things like that, we start to think of trauma as something that happens at in homes or in the dark or in private places. But I think that we really have to broaden our understanding of it because there are, as proven by the, the women who have shared their stories in this anthology, for some of them, going to work on a regular basis was like entering a war zone. It was like living with an abuser. It was like all of those things. And we have to be very careful that we're not minimizing people's experience because it may be a word that we don't like. Um, I would say if you don't like the word traumatic, then just say stressful, say distressing, say it's overwhelming. But really at the end of the day, we're all talking about the same thing. And so we, we've got to acknowledge that especially leaders have to understand that the workplaces can be traumatic because if the leaders understand that, then they can take the responsibility in creating safe spaces for their employees. Everybody's talking now about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it sounds good, but many of these places aren't putting any active policies and procedures and actual like steps in place to prevent their folks from being traumatized in much the way that these 20 women have been. I, I agree. And those are some very, very good points, Tiffany, um, that I don't think a lot of people, um, again, I don't think they sit down and think about what they have gone through as it being something that impacts their mental health, as something that's being a traumatic experience. They know that it's uncomfortable and sometimes they can and sometimes they even can't associate it with racism. But those are some very, very good points. So thank you for bringing that up. So we're going to go ahead and continue with our question. Can a work environment be traumatic? If so, what does it look like? So Carol and Dr. Dangerfield, what do you all, what do you think? Who, Which one of you wants to speak next? All right, Dr. I'll, Dangerfield. Uh, I'll speak about it, what it looks like. It could be something, at, uh, and I won't say simple, but it could be anything that triggers an individual. So it could be the tone of the voice of the leader, of the manager, someone coming in, breathing down a person's neck, barking orders, can make the uh, work environment traumatic for the individual because as, um, Tiffany said, it's personally defined what tra how trauma impacts the individual. So it could be it could be uh, the way the sounds within the place. It could be something as simple as a scent or odor that if a person has experienced some form of trauma, and when they walk into the workplace, and that scent, that smell, it triggers them. They can consider their workplace to be traumatic. But it, it goes back to behaviors. Also, how are managers, how are leaders showing up? How are other coworkers showing up? Because a coworker can be traumatic by the way that they present themselves. So it can be it can be several different things. And you may not you may say, well, my workplace, I haven't been, you know, uh, sexually harassed are physically harassed, but the emotional harassment that comes with showing up every day and having someone bark orders at you or being in an environment that has a scent that, that triggers you, that can be traumatic to someone and it may not be traumatic to the next person sitting next to you. Yeah. I also like to say that as well, we recognize it in if we're feeling safe. And again, that as, as we're saying, it's going to be different for everyone. If there is a survival, when we're in survival, our bodies in fight or flight, all of that. So it's anything that we do, we say, we think about or believe that that feels like a threat to us. And trauma happens very quickly. It just overrides our thinking. We're in a place of survival. And again, as we're all saying, it's unique to all of us. Our bodies feel overwhelmed and trust. We have to trust that within ourselves because we are all coming into the workplace 
with different stories and different narratives. I, I, I totally agree, Carol. Um, again, you know, everybody's trauma is not going to look the same. Just like, you know, when, when we get sick, as we've seen, even with COVID, COVID doesn't look the same from one person to the next. Trauma in the workplace doesn't look the same from one person to the next. And also how someone deals with those traumatic experiences within the workplace. And I think it also can be compounded with have they experienced previous traumas in their life and now you're in the workplace. And so your past is now being impacted by your present, you know, your boss, your coworkers, maybe even a client or a customer is also causing you to have some experiences or, you know, as a form of therapist, a trigger or a flashback. So mental health looks different on everyone. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. And when I was a therapist, one thing that I saw was that a lot of people try to put it in a box and compartmentalize it and it's, and the individuals who were experiencing it. And it's not that at all, that it can be different. It's going to look different on, on everyone. And I think that takes us into our second question of the night, um, which is how does the mental health system perpetuate racism? So who wants to tackle that one first? I'll jump in. <laughs> as we know, our uh, mental health system as a whole uh, has been set up where it, it leaves, uh, leaves out the, those that do not have. So a lot of times that is looking at black and brown people that may not have the means. So the system perpetuates racism by not having services available, cutting funding in certain uh, communities where there are not, uh, where individuals may not have insurance or they have insurance and their insurance deductible is so high that they cannot afford services. The other piece is if we look at even the makeup of the professionals within the mental health profession it was dominated and created by white males. Probably in the last what, 10 years is where you're seeing more therapists and mental health professionals of color making, a, uh, making themselves known that I'm out here to serve you. But it's still, we have so many people in the United States, but the number, it's less than 10% of mental health professionals of color available to provide services. So the system also keeps the professional out by so many hoops that you have to jump to even get licensed to practice or to be seen as a mental health professional or even some of the teaching in the school. So our system is not made for individuals of color and it perpetuates racism because when you don't have or you're uh, shunned because of your assessment, because of the color of your skin, it shuts you out or shuts you down. I agree a hundred percent. And I definitely think our school systems play a big role in this. The way we, we, we talk to our social workers, the way we give them choice around the kind of courses that they should be taken, not a course that's an elective, but a, a course that talks about difference and really gets down to the grassroots of things, it doesn't happen. And when we do, it's a very light course. So it's a course that we don't want to make people upset in. In reality, they're going out though into the field and hurting people. So I think we need to do a better job of training our social workers, training our mental health system support people so that when they go out into the system, they don't have these thoughts in their mind thinking that they're there to save people or they think they know their, their stories when in reality, every one story is unique and you need to then service them as such. So yeah, I'm really passionate about this. I think 
we need a lot of work in this area. It's very, very, very sad and upsetting when I see social workers who think they know one black person and so they know all black people. But I think that that also speaks to our formal training. All of the the predominant um, theoretical lenses that we're taught were established by, tested on, normalized on folks who don't look like us. And so I can't, as a Black woman of faith, come into a space with a white practitioner and start talking about how I talked to God last night about my problems without immediately being labeled a schizophrenic and having some kind of delusion and all of that. And I've seen that. Um, I had a coworker where the woman was Afro-Caribbean and was was upset, was really stressed out because um, there was a family that they were feuding with that she felt like had worked some roots on her. And the woman was just like super dismissive and was like, no, you need to get a psyche valve. You need to be on medication, all this other kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, you're not like you didn't hear anything that she said. If you had sat and attended to her initial concern, which is I have this problem with someone and there that problem is now impacting everything else. You could have maybe gotten her some help and, and given her some assistance, but you couldn't see past that. And so we're immediately pathologized from the minute we walk in because we don't have systems of, of thinking about problems that really support who we are in all of our diversity and all of our richness and all of our really spirituality. Because most people of color are very spiritual people. Like very rarely do you find a person of color, any color, black, brown, otherwise, who is not does not have a strong faith component to their their literal existence. But when you look at the practitioners, majority of them have favored science over religion. And so if you bring in any kind of religious context to a conversation, immediately you're somehow crazy and you know you just need to be pumped full of meds. Which then the other side of that is when we do find someone who may be willing to listen to us, the immediate solution is always medication. It's always Western medicine. It's not more traditional practices. It's not anything herbal. It's not, you know, so there are so many different ways that our mental health system has failed us as a community. Let's not even talk about the fact that most people of color have a strong distrust for the establishment because of the history of experimentation. You know, most people who were interested in people of color historically in any of these spaces were only interested so that they could experiment on us. So it's not even a safe space. So there are so many different levels um, at which the whole system becomes, you know, very difficult to navigate. And to Dr. Dangerfield's point, if there aren't enough folks who look like you in that system, then you're not going to really give it a shot to try and get the relief and the release that you might actually need. I can speak from my experience, um, again, from being someone, um, actually, when I was a therapist and going through a very, very traumatic experience in the workplace and, you know, a diagnosing my own self and saying, OK, you need to go see a therapist like this is not this is not going to go away. And in order for you to function, you're going to need a support system outside of your family and friends. Like I had to realize that myself. Um, the problem that I ran into, um, which we don't talk about or we didn't talk about, I don't know what, the, what, what that conversation is like anymore, was that, A, not only was I a Black therapist who could not find another Black therapist, the other problem that I ran into was that I, am we I was well known in my state. And so I had therapists to tell me that it would be a conflict of interest to work with me because they had I read a book that you wrote because I, I you know, I, I follow you on social media. So me finding help was like finding a needle in a haystack on top of when I did find someone who didn't know me. I also realized they didn't know what in the hell they were doing. Um, they, they were not black, so it was not a black therapist. Um, I ran into one therapist who talked about her issues the whole session. 
And, you know, and finally I just, you know, after I got enough, I was just like, here's my copay, I'm not coming back. And I explained to her that I was a therapist. So finding that, that help that I needed was very difficult. And unfortunately, I did not find anyone who looked like me because four years ago in the state of Louisiana, a lot of blacks were not in clinical practice. They were still working nine to fives. Um, the other point that I want to make, and I think this is with Dangerfield and um, Dr. Dangerfield and Carol, was as being a professor uh, <laughs> who's teaching these individuals, one thing that I found as a big problem with the curriculum was that the history, especially in the field of social work, had been changed. and It had been whitewashed and Blacks had been removed from the history. And so students were only being taught one side of the history of social work. And it was basically how these whites came in and they saved the world. And they didn't, it didn't talk about your found, how your founding forefathers of the field of social work are actually African-Americans who were making these major contributions. And I think that does a disservice to us because you know, A, we're feeling like we're not even making a contribution to the to the field. But then I think would dishearten me. And, and I tell people this. I was at an HBCU when I discovered this, when I went through the textbook and, you know, went in and was like, hello, you anybody looked at this book to see the blacks or not? Like we got blacks on the walls, but the book that you're using does not talk about the contributions that blacks made. And there is a textbook out there that actually covers this. And why aren't we using this in the curriculum versus this whitewash version? Um, because our students are going to be servicing people that look like us. I know when I started out back in 1993 or 94, when I first started out, I, I can honestly say when I worked at agencies, I would usually be the only black, but all the clients were black. And so I found myself being the advocate for these individuals. And the conversation behind closed doors and at the table was that they needed to be saved. They needed to be rescued. And my thing was, no, they just need resources and they need tools to show them how to get from point A to point B because I also happened to be a social worker who went back into my community that I grew up in. So I knew that what they were trying to say about these people, I grew up with these people. I was one of those individuals. And some of them had just fallen on hard times, but it wasn't that, um, you know, and some of it was job related. I had someone who had hurt her back and lost her job. And all of a sudden she went from having an income to no income and taking care of her kids. And the system was treating her like she was just this welfare mom. And it was like her first time ever having to access the system. But because it was her first time, she didn't know how to navigate the system. And so when people don't sit down and have a conversation with you and get to know you as an individual, but they, again, put you in this box, generalize you, clump everybody together, which we learned last night in voting. Um, well, actually two nights ago when everybody kept saying Latinos and now we're finding out that Cubans and people from Mexico, like that's two different groups of people. And Cubans don't take too kindly to y'all lack, lumping them up in the same category with 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 those who are from Mexico. And so we start to see that all these generalizations with people of color is a problem. But the general generalizations start because people are not taking the time to get to know people, to know their history, to know where they're coming from, to know their backgrounds, to know that, OK, they might have a, a they come from a very religious family. So the way that you process this with them or you connect with them is going to be totally different. Lastly, when I finally found help for myself when I was going through my situation back in 2015, I remember the psychiatrist that I saw, he was a white Jew. He was Jewish and he was white. And when I described what was going on with me, he told me that me thinking 24 seven was abnormal and I needed to be on medication because that wasn't normal. 
And when I took the medication, I, I remembered that I, would, I felt like I was moving in neutral. That my And I was like, well, wait a minute, that might not be normal for some people, but for me, my brain works 24 seven. And that doesn't mean that I'm crazy. That doesn't mean I need to be on medication, but he hasn't even taken the time out to get to know me. When I described my work environment, which at this point I had been locked in an office by a student because I was at a university and a student had a, was their intentions were to rape me. They had been sexually harassing me. And it had got to the point where the therapist said I needed to take FML, like I needed to be removed from the situation immediately. And the psychiatrist said that I needed to learn how to work through it. And we went through hell and back to get him to do the paperwork for FMLA because he did not see what I had went through as being trauma or traumatic. So again, a lot of what we're talking about, it depends on who's seeing it, who you're getting help from, and knowing that you can fire your therapist. Like you don't have to keep sitting there listening to that BS. When you know it's BS, you can be like, I'm out and let me take my coins somewhere else. So those are things that we 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 need to keep in mind. And um, I'm not going to hog the conversation, but um, y'all jobs also have EAP. So if they don't have great insurance, go to HR, ask some people about um, the employee assistance program, because that will pay for you to get therapy. And they do not go back and report to your job the conversations that you have with your therapist. Um, So I don't ramble on anybody else got something to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and move into our next question for the night. And it is, how do women or men heal from a wrongful dismissal, especially when they believe racism is playing a large role in the incident? And I know this happens a lot. And Carol, I think this was your question. Yes. You know, when I when I thought of this question, I thought of all the people that I kind of sit with. And the first thing in terms of just recognizing people come in and they're denying that racism took place. They're kind of in a back and forth. Did it happen? I don't know. And so part of what, what we kind of do is just recognize that if if you've experienced it, if you feel it, then that's what we're going with. And so the first part of that is just kind of recognizing that we have to normalize that and be able to sit with that and not fight ourselves because that in itself, what we know about racism is that it, it can live in our bodies and, and it has for many of us for many years and that we have to recognize that moving through it, we have to be gentle with ourselves. But the first thing is to say, yes, call it what it is. Because I think that it, it'll then get us back into our thinking in our thinking brain and we can start to heal. So one thing I kind of kind of do it we do is some checkpoints. So now that you've experienced this, how do you feel with yourself? Because we need to do the healing around ourselves, around if we find ourselves now in a kind of self-hate place, in a place where we're internalizing negative thoughts about ourselves. So we do a little bit of work around that so that we can ground people so that they can now start to start to put themselves in a place where they can say things weren't right. And the other thing I see sometimes with people is that they replace situations in their mind and they, they wish they had done something different. And the other, I just kind of work with them around, you did what you could in that moment. We can't, and, and, and just recognize that racism is hard. It's hard on all of us. In that moment, you did what you could. And now we kind of go through the, the process of, OK, so if you could say something to that person, what would you say? Because we want to do it in a safe place. You know, we can call up our girlfriends. We can call up our moms. We can tell them the story. But I want to really sit with the person and, and kind of recognize what did you want to say? What, what are some of the things that you really wanted to share? Because oftentimes when we find ourselves in workplaces where we can't speak, when we can't share our thoughts, that in itself is a grief. So we had expectations of what we thought the job was going to be. And then when we get there, we're fighting, <laughs> for lack of a better word, devils. We're fighting things that we never thought would have been part of this process. 
And so recognizing that we need to take some time to really heal that part too. You know, you went into this workplace expecting this and the other, and instead you were doing two jobs, your own and kind of figuring out now I have to show up again tomorrow. And recognizing that all of this work takes time and that it's really important that we want to make sure that the person recognizes that this incident was not right. It should not have happened and that we don't need to blame anyone, especially not yourself. We don't need to avoid the emotion because what we know about trauma is that it gets stuck in the body. And that part of that work is just kind of sitting with people and healing and talking about what do they want to do next? How do they see themselves? You're wonderful and beautifully made. How do we bring that back up to the surface? Because this is a hurtful and difficult time. So it's just my thoughts. Great points, Carol. Uh, Tiffany and Dr. Dangerfield, have y'all seen cases like this in your practices? I think that to, to piggyback on what Carol said, it's very important to realize that this isn't your fault. It's you, you, that same way that you help someone who's a trauma survivor with maybe childhood trauma or, you know, something like that. It's the same thing. It's getting back to yourself, taking your power back and realizing that this had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with who they are and just kind of getting the person back in that place so that they can kind of get their mojo back. Because it's for someone who, especially somebody who is very, um, who very strongly identifies themselves by what they do and who they are, to have a dismissal where someone is really calling your character into question, it, it, it hurts different, right? And so trying to help that person understand this has nothing to do with you. This is this person. That's how they think. That's how they operate. This is all on them. This has nothing to do with you. They just picked you to express who they were in this moment and helping folks kind of get their power back around that and understand, like, like Carol said, you, you're, you're the bomb.com. Like you, you are great. Lean into that because that energy is what's going to take you to a place of healing where now you can go into the next space with your eyes open, you'll know how to recognize those red flags, but you'll still be fully and confidently you. If you allow this to shrink you, you're not really going to be you. You're going to sh be showing up as some other person who you're not going to be able to, to really be for long term. You can't keep that act up. There's only one you, so you got to get back to that person. Good point. Good point. Dr. Dangerfield. Well, in my work, and especially since I work a lot with other mental health professionals, this, uh, when something like this happens, it, uh, as both ladies have said, it puts a kink, uh, like a kink in their armor. One, they're questioning, did it really happen? Because it's like, this is the work, and we're, I work in an environment, and especially under the, uh, under the language of a trauma-informed environment. And when something happens that perpetuates and that it was like, it was something ra racial that happened, especially when you're working in an environment and you're probably one, one of maybe three uh, individuals of color, black, uh, black woman, as, and then get dismissed, about the work and it's like your white counterpart could have done the same thing not meeting numbers or didn't um didn't complete the paperwork and you know who's doing less because as black women we already know that when most of the time when we stepping up in the place we doing 150 percent because we have been taught that you have to do more just to show up to be seen. So to be wrongly, wrongfully dismissed, you're like, I crossed my, you know, I crossed my teeth, I dotted my eyes. I just didn't make my numbers for the last two months because I'm overworked. But then your other, your counterpart is still there doing the same thing or less. So come back into the, when they come into the, Space, the counseling space, they're like beat down 
And so being able to help them to understand, as both ladies said, that you are who you are and it's not about you. It was the environment. And that what you experienced was what you experienced and it was true for you. Well, all righty now. So we done just, that was a mouthful. That's all I got to say. And, and I think, I don't know about everybody else and those out there that are listening, but I have definitely been in the environment where I'm work, putting in a 200% and I'm getting called in and pink slips and, you know, and it's just like, well, what more do you want? But then I see that my, my counterpart, my white counterpart, male or female, is giving 50 percent. You know, so you you what's happening, what I have seen is that a black woman in the workplace finds herself carrying her load, but also the load of others. Which again, if we look at the, the thread of this company, of this country, especially what we've seen with the elections, it is usually black women who are taking on the loads of everyone and making sure that it just gets done. And so then to be uh, wrongfully called out or wrongfully dismissed from your job and you know that it had nothing to do with your capabilities. Um, and, and not even your qualifications that you're qualified, that you are, you know, you got you like you said, dotted all your eyes, crossed all your T's, that you're still being scrutinized and let go. That hits us. That hits differently. And again, we have to realize that that is a traumatic event. Um, and y'all might see my um, dog in the background. That's Stacy. She make grand appearances sometimes. So she wants to join us on our final night. So don't get scared. That's who that is. That's Stacy walking around in the bed. Just letting everybody know. Oh, uh, so we go. go. You know, I got to tell y'all, people start screaming. And girl, what's that in the background? That's Stacy. That's, that's my dog. So she wanted to come in tonight. So don't worry about her. So we're going to go on to our next question for the night. And it is, when does one begin to seek therapy and how can we get out of our own way to get the help that we need? So who wants to tackle that one first? I'll, I'll jump in on that one. I think you start to seek therapy the moment you feel uncomfortable. If you wait until something happens, from a purely logistical standpoint, you don't have any documentation that shows that this was causing you some distress. Like, let's just be honest. And in a lot of these situations where, like we were saying before, it's like, did this really happen to me? Am I crazy? You know, am I the only one? Was this really racism? If the minute you start to feel like something's off, you start going and speaking to a professional if nothing else, you have a documented history of involvement with a professional so that if you have to go to HR, if you have to go to the court, if you have to go wherever you have to go, you have something that backs you up in writing. It's no longer a feeling. You've got some documented proof that this was causing you, again, to go back to the original question, some distress, some discomfort. So you've already made your case before anything, you know, anything really escalates and gets better. Not to mention you have that support of someone to help you successfully navigate whatever might come up next. And I know we've talked about, you know, some of the hurdles in the mental health system, but black therapists do exist. Hello, there are four of well, three of us, three and a half of us on here right now. <laughs> she said, I don't want it. There are three of us on here right now. Like there are a ton of excellent resources within the past couple of years that have come up. You have therapy for black girls. You've got therapy for black men. You've got clinicians of color directory. You've got um, therapy tribe. You've got all of these great resources. Um, and now psychology today is trying to jump on the bandwagon a little later after they got their behind handed to them about not being diverse. That's a whole nother conversation. They even have a, a section where you can search specifically for a, a therapist of color, but we've got so many resources that we can find, we can make those connections. So don't let some of this other, like, don't let people psych you out of getting the support and the help that you need. First of all, if nothing else, look at it as your insurance policy that I have somebody who I'm talking to who can, who is documenting that I'm having these conversations about these specific things. So if I need it, 
I can I can fall back on it. That that's I mean, if, if no other reason, use your therapist in that way. And like I said, use one of those resources. Find a therapist who looks like you, who can relate to you to really get the help that you need. Getting out of your own way is just really acknowledging that something might be wrong. It doesn't even have to be absolutely wrong. You don't even have to have arrived at that point yet. But when you get to the point that something doesn't feel right, reach out, make that connection so that you have some support and more importantly, some paperwork. Love it. Love it. Love it. Girl, wait, let, go back for a second. Y'all got to do a sidebar conversation. When did psychology today start doing all this? I know, I, I know I've been out the loop for a while. So about a month there. ago, about a month ago. Well, let me go back a little further. About two months ago, um, one of their contributing bloggers wrote a blog about why calling out Karens in the workplace. This again, this goes back to how like this system is like really rigged against us. Um, pretty much called it bullying and that we shouldn't call out Karens, that it's offensive and we shouldn't do all of, you know, we shouldn't do all of that. Oddly enough, this is a guy who was running for APA president at the time this was going on. So he was he was running as the president of the APA. He writes this blog. Um, the rest of the black folks that were on psychology today, because folks were leaving because every magazine they have, every publication they have is this super thin, super white, you know, male or female. Um, and they weren't addressing issues of people of color consistently. So there was a huge exodus before this blog. When the blog post gets released, the rest of the black folks that were on there just had had enough wrote some petitions and things like that to psychology today about their insensitive insensitivity um and the lip service that they pay to dei work but no real anything to back it up and so this was kind of their um this was their cleanup so now they have a directory that has you can specifically search for um a clinician of color so yeah which I do tell. Okay. I learned something new. Mm. All righty then. So, Carol, Dr. Dangerfield, when does one begin to I, seek therapy? I just want people to get out of their way in terms of just if they're recognizing they're blaming themselves, they're denying, they're fight, they're, they're finding themselves fighting with family members, that's out of the ordinary, something is off. Ask yourself some good questions. Thinking and your feeling and your behavior is different. I love, you know, it's so important of what was said earlier. Go and seek someone, talk to someone. Really, you know, therapists, what we're, we're doing is holding space for you. We're allowing you to, to give you one hour or you pay for one hour to talk about Anything that's on your mind, that's for you, that's happening for you, use the time. No one's interrupting you. All we're doing is trying to get clarity around what's happening in the situation. And so use, use the money that you're already paying into, right? Allow yourself to be in, that, in the presence of just sharing and being um, heard. And I think it's so important to yeah, just recognize that something's different and just to handle that. Thanks, as best Carol. As you can. That's a danger feel. Uh, just as both have said, those are that's those are the things that we should do. And I always look at going to therapy and getting out of my own way or getting out of your own way is your self care. You're taking care of self. So think about it. If you wanted to go get you a nice pair of shoes to put on your feet so your feet can look good, if your mind is not right. Your feet can look as good as they want to be. But if you are not right, if you are not sleeping at night, if you are in a meeting and you feel tearful or you're always angry, it's time to do some self-care. It's time to take care of yourself. So get your mind right so your feet can look right. <laughs> your hair, all of it. We because we have we have we have uh, made self care simple. Like we say, oh, if I go get my nails done, I go get give me a mani and a patty, 
I go spend, you know, go buy me something cute to wear. I've done self care. No, getting out of your own way is going to see a therapist or going to finding you a safe space to unload because we know being all of our awesomeness as women of color and black women. Hey, it takes it takes us to go talk to somebody to take some of this awesomeness and put it on their couch for 50 minutes to an hour. Say, oh, girl, I'm tired. All this stuff going on at work, I'm tired. But you, I'm taking care of myself because I'm sitting here with you to talk about what's going on. So that's how we can get out of our get out of our own way. Acknowledge it and go go get us some help. Thank you, Dr. Dangerfield, <laughs> for reminding us. If we can go get our hair done, we can go get our nails done, we can go get an hour massage. You can go invest in sitting on someone's sofa for 45 minutes to an hour and unloading all of that emotional baggage that you've been carrying around for however long. And guess what? You feel, y'all, look, therapy for me, that was like having a glass of wine because I felt so much better. I ain't gonna lie. And then I I could go and rationally get my hair done and my nails done and look good on the outside because I had taken care of what was going on on the inside. I had got my mind right. Cause see, you know, some of us be about to flash out on these jobs and I'm, I'm not gonna lie. My dad last job I worked on, we finally got the psych, you know, so people want to update. We got the psychiatrist to fill out the paperwork for FMLA. When I flashed out, I flashed out, but in me flashing out, I called my therapist as I was flashing out. I called a therapist who said, and she walked me through, okay, I need you to get all of your things. I need you to exit the building. I need you to get in your vehicle. I'm going to stay on the phone with you. Who is someone you can call? Like she helped to bring me down, but she also acknowledged it has gotten out of hand and this is not your fault anymore. Like this isn't your fault. And that's how we got the, 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 the psychiatrist on board. She basically called him and gave him a piece of her mind of this is what's happened. But that was because I had those people in place. Imagine those of us who are on jobs and they're flashing out or you don't even know you being triggered and don't know. What's, and you ain't got nobody to talk to. Your mama telling you take it to the Lord in prayer. Your husband telling you, look, we got these bills to pay. I'm just going to need you to stay on this job and work it out. Like, we, come on, I need you to get it together. Your girlfriend's telling you, yeah, girl, but and they trying to tell you what's going on with their man because they ain't trying to hear what's going on. So no one is giving you, as Carol said, that space to sit down and just unload all of what you're feeling emotionally uninterrupted and to give you some non-biased feedback and help guide you in how to become a better person. Like on social media, if y'all want to talk about self-care, that's some real self-care. Because once you get that right, and I'm just telling you from a black woman who has went to therapy and I, I therapy saved my life. Y'all, if y'all gonna talk about some self-care, go see a therapist. Go see, and if you got a good therapist, they get you all the way together. You walk out like you done had a whole hour of massage, like you you got a new pep in your step. I mean, you it's a whole different feeling. But we've got to remove those stigmas that we have in the black community that um that are around therapy and mental health. Um, and that it is a bad thing that taking care of your your mental and your psychic is just as important as you take care of everything else in your life so thank you so much for 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 sharing that with um with all of us today so ladies as we wrap up yes guys we are coming to a close this is the end of the whole series on how racism impacts black women in corporate America. So I'm going to let the therapists go around the room. Um, again, they're going to tell you their names and let you know where you can find out more about them. 
And if you have not grabbed your copy of the anthology, the website is down below, Shut Them Down Anthology. Make sure you go ahead and you pre-order a copy. Um, and the anthology should be coming out in about two weeks on Amazon. But uh, I hope that you will support not only these three experts who are in the anthology, but the other 20 women who have shared their stories of their traumatic experiences of racism in the workplace. So let's wrap it up and take us home. So Tiffany, where can they learn more about you and what it is that you do? So you can find me at www.awakeningchange.org or here on LinkedIn, just Tiffany Jenkins. Um, either one of those, you can reach out to me. Um, and yeah, I look forward to interacting with you guys. Thanks again, Dr. Carey, for the opportunity. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Dr. Dangerfield, you need a line of t-shirts because you had too many good one-liners in there, sis. Like I'm I'm going to need to find this self-care line that you got going on uh, in 2021. <laughs> Carol. So yes, uh, definitely you can jump online, www.carolconsults.ca and you can find me here on LinkedIn. I'm doing a couple of Thursdays, um, a round table. You can jump on that. Always looking for ways to support the community, looking for ways for us to just really get closer to being aware of mental health being just a part of just filling up so that we can go back out. Right. And so I'm um, always excited. And thank you so much for Dr. Carey for, for this opportunity. This is a great opportunity to just share. You thank are you. welcome, Carol. And Dr. Dangerfield. Well, you can find me on LinkedIn at Lucretia. It's L A C R E C I A Dangerfield. Or you can find me, uh, my website is www.reimprintyourlife.com, which is R E M I M M R E I M P R I N T your life. <laughs> Reimprint your life. <laughs> And I'm just going to put it out there. So Tiffany is in New Jersey. Carol is in Toronto, Canada. Yeah, I got y'all somebody out the U.S. And Dr. Dangerfield is in Nashville, Tennessee. Right, Dr. Dangerfield? All right. So I'd have brought you some therapists from some different parts of, of the world, not just the United States. Um, and they are also on therapy for black girls. So you can, if you are looking for a mental health therapist in any of these areas, they are on there. They are also on the website for the anthology. So again, you can go check them out there, go find their website there. So we'd have made it real easy for you to find them. Okay. In 2020 and 2021. Um, and they are also, again, they are the experts for the anthology and they are contributing. Each of them contributed a chapter on mental health as it impacts black women in the workplace and, and trauma. So, again, if you have not grabbed your copy of the anthology, the website is down below. Um, I thank everyone who has joined us for the past five weeks as we have done this. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you. And I hope that everyone has a great evening. And